So uh, our next speaker uh, is a student from Dusseldorf, Germany. Uh, when she's not studying, she is contributing to Node Core or helping out with the Node Technical Steering Committee. So, you know, Node's just a little hobby of hers. Uh, so I just want to say uh, welcome to Anna Henningsen. Yeah, so my talk is titled uh, One Week in the Life of Node.js. Um, that is not literal, but my, what I want to do is uh, to give everybody here a bit of a better impression of what actually happens on the technical side of Node.js. And OK, so first, who am I? Um, I think Tracy basically covered all of that. Um, just like have, have a perspective. I have been on the project since about one and a half years. I got my first commit in, in December 2015, and yeah. Okay, and um, I want to show you like basically what I did for my first commit because I think there, I, I'm I'm going to tell you why I did that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so basically, if you have this code, um, it, it's obviously not something you're supposed to write. You got set timeout. You got the arguments wrong. Um, one of those numbers is supposed to be a function. And so what that did back then is it scheduled a timeout w with uh, one second. And after the timeout, it tried to execute the number 1,000 as a function. So <laughs> um, you got this really, really helpful error, um, which like, especially the stack trace is just like, it really tells you what happened. Um, yeah, so um, I, I ran into this problem in a application that I developed with Node. And so what I did was, OK, yeah, I, can, I can either look for all these set timeouts in my code, or I could patch Node. So the, the general idea is very simple. I added like a simple type check to set timeout. And basically, that was my first commit. Um, it's pretty simple. There was a bit more to it, like adding tests and documentation. But this is the general idea. It's like, why did I show you this? Um, I think this shows like um, anybody who actually uses Node probably runs into these small usability problems. And anybody who does so has a great opportunity to help, sh help shape how Node works. Um, OK. so. Um, why do I want to tell you about what happens within the Node.js GitHub organization? So back before I was a collaborator, I was still developing applications with Node, but I didn't really have an idea of, of what was actually happening. Um, I, I sometimes witnessed like releases were made, or um, I got a, I, like, I didn't really know much about the io.js fork, but I know that it happened. Uh, I heard about the merger, but basically that's a, that was about it. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of feel like it was still a lot of the people in the community don't really have an idea of, of what we actually do. And the you Node.js know, GitHub organization is a whole hidden world. We, we can really tell because like, it's always this, the same kind of people interacting with each other. It's our little bubble. And yeah. So that isn't necessarily a bad thing, because like the fact that you, like most of you, don't usually have to engage with, with Node Core is good, because it means Node is stable, stable. You don't have to deal with its bugs on an everyday basis. Obviously, there are still bugs and everything, but you can pretty much just use it without worrying about that. Also, it works as an abstraction. And what I mean when I say that is, you don't have to understand how it works. I, I would imagine in the early days of Node, that was pretty different. But it's also a bad thing. The patch like the one that I showed you, I probably wouldn't do that anymore. Because like honestly, I don't develop applications with Node anymore. Um, I write the occasional small script or something. But I don't really do that. Because like all of my time goes into Node Core. And it's a lot of fun. I enjoy doing that. But still, um, 
Also, this kind of system where we, where we mostly talk to each other, um, that's not really helpful for getting other people involved. And it's important that other people, like most people in this room, can actually inter, um, interact with us, talk with us, and make changes just as easily as I did my first one. And finally, um, one thing I'm really not happy about is that um, people like me, actually, um, are very privileged when it comes to information on how Node Core works. It's important that you do not have to understand it, but it's really, it's, it would really be better if a lot more people knew about the internals. And there have been some efforts at like writing documentation on how that works, but I'm not aware of anything that like that is you know the the standard work on how Node actually works. And okay, so. What happens under the GitHub organization? Um, a lot of the bigger things James mentioned earlier. So, but first of all, it's a lot of things. I have like some numbers um, coming up later. Um, and the formal definition of what we do there, which is in the TSC charter, is that the TSC oversees all technical development within the Node.js foundation. And that we basically made the decision, we want to do all of this on GitHub. Which is a good thing in itself because, um, you know, other projects like the Linux kernel, they use mailing lists which have even lower accessibility than, well, I mean, like, GitHub is pretty okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, most of you have a GitHub account and, like, I would guess, like, five or six people in this room maybe don't, but, yeah. Okay, so, um, there, some things are pretty big and some things you probably have heard of like Chakra Core being integrated with Node, or I know James mentioned it, there were talks on it, the NAPI work, where we integrate a new native interface for Node. Um, but also, like, on the Node.js slash Node repository itself, there are many, many indivi individual issues in PRs. Um, I took a look at the ones that got the most comments in the last 90 days. Um, that was like, it isn't unexpected to see the first one, which is ES module support, got 200 plus comments. Um, that's just because like, nobody's really happy talking about it, but everybody has opinions on it. And that, that just works out to like really long discussions. Uh, I'm glad we, we got that done and like, um, you should all, if you ever run into Bradley Mack, I, I'm not sure whether it's here, but you should really, really be thankful to him because nobody has as much energy uh, in dealing with everybody's opinion than he does. Yeah. Um, the next thing is something that I was kind of surprised to see. Um, async stack traces for the inspector, like the, the Chrome debugger, um, which is really cool to see happen. Um, and the, finally, the initial PR for HTTP2, which it just got a lot of review, um, so that's why it got that many comments. And there's also less big stuff happening that generates a lot of things that we talk about. For one thing, V8 updates. Um, people have mentioned it, and uh, I can just really confirm that um, Google and V8 have, have really improved on communicating with us, and we are in a great situation there. But it's still like the case, whenever we want to update V8, um, one of the things that happens a lot is Node supports many, many platforms, um, more than V8 usually focuses on. So it's not unusual that, um, for example, some, some that V8 doesn't build on FreeBSD with CLang anymore or something like that. We have to deal with these kinds of stuff. But also, like recently, and I, as I said, I looked at the last 90 days, um, um, we have been talking more and more about keeping V8 up to date within existing node release lines. For example, Node 8 um, has started out with V8 5.8. It got bumped to V8 6.0 later. 
And two days ago, Miles opened the proposal for node 8.7.0, which actually contains um, V8.6.1. And all of this work in making, making the, VI, uh, the V8 versions API compatible, compatible with each other, uh, that's a lot of work to me. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of smaller features that get implemented over time. You probably haven't heard, but like, for example, uh, process.dl open, which is a function that all basically already nobody uses. <laughs> um, it got a new option for adding flag support to it. That just generated 170 comments on its own because like it was, uh, it was really good that we did it because like there came a lot of in positive internal refactoring with it. But yeah. Um, also like one of the other things that got a lot of comments was a PR from uh, one of our newer collaborators, Ruben Bridgewater, uh, who improved util.inspect performance a bit. And uh, yeah, that was also like a lot of work because it was a lot of refactoring of util, of the entire module basically, or at least the inspect part, which if you ever look at util.js, it's pretty much just inspection stuff. And finally, one of the other large things is promise support in NAPI which it just took a while to figure out what is the best API for this. And so like, I think we went to like, through two or three approaches for that. Um, there are things that I'm not going to talk about a lot. Or, um, so one thing that is under the GitHub organization that many of us in the core team don't really keep an eye on, but this is still there, is the internationalization working groups. So th those are working groups for specific languages where the idea is that um, things like release notes or documentation get translated into, into languages. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of that has stalled or is stalling. Um, one of the internationalization working groups that has been active for a long time is the Korean one. Um, and I looked at it like they had the last commit four days ago or so. So that is pretty much still there, but we don't hear much about the other ones, and yeah, a lot of them are just stalled. And uh, there are, we also maintain other projects like the HTTP parser library that Node uses itself, or um, debugging tools like LLNode or Node Report. Um, but those also, like, they aren't technically part of Node Core or not yet. Okay, so in the last 90 days, I have gotten over 37,000 emails in my note inbox, <laughs> um, which is just like, it's a lot to keep up with. And like, I actually graphed the, the repos that generated these, and the core repo itself, it just generated 28,000 notifications on its own, which is like, uh, you can do the math, it's like, it, I think it comes down to about 300 uh, emails, emails per day. It's a lot to keep up with, and when I say I don't develop applications with Node, this is why. Um, but we have also, we have other repositories. Um, we have the TSC repository where we basically just talk meta stuff, uh, try to or have conversations between collaborators. Um, we have the build repository where the build working group works. Uh, they, they are there for keeping our CI working, uh, our release tooling, stuff like that. And unfortunately, CI is kind of problematic sometimes, so that is a reason why um, they have to deal a lot with this. Um, one of my favorite repositories within the organization is the help repository. Not many people know about that, um, but it's basically the idea is that we have a space for Q&A. Um, whenever you have a problem with uh, a node application or a question or anything, you can just come to this repository and ask it. It's kind of, the idea is kind of like Stack Overflow. Um, but one of the nice things about it is like a lot of us core collaborators actually watch that repository. And so whenever we can help out with something, uh, we, we actually answer there. And it's, it's one of the places where, where there's always a really friendly tone because like, yeah. No, nobody's forced to be there, and we're just like um, trying to figure out problems that people are having. Uh, if you want, you can also watch the repository and try to answer questions of your own. 
Other things like Docker Node, which is maintaining Docker images for Node. Uh, the community committee. Um, then moderation, which is like an internal repository that uh, uh, we can't discuss the contents of, but it's pretty obvious what it's there for, and the fact that it is there is not a secret. And yeah, a lot of other th small repositories. Like, for example, the Nappy C++ wrapper, which is probably what you're going to want to use if you actually use Nappy for something. Um, the admin repo, where we work together with the community committee for shared stuff that we cannot divide because it is one GitHub organization, like moderation policy, um, stuff like that. Um, the code and learn repository, where we actually figure out what we're going to do at tomorrow's code and learn, and where we get mentors together, these things. Um, a security working group where we work on policies for our security um, processes, reporting issues to us, or making releases, making announcements, these things. And unfortunately, again, there are stalling efforts, installed efforts. Uh, for example, we have been working on an electron-based installer for a while, but the thing is, there's nobody who's really keep trying to um, push the work on it. And so we, any effort within the organization, as long as it's open source and um, as long as nobody feels obligated to do something, it's probably not going to happen. Um, then the, the, uh, the internationalization working group, which is not like one of the per language ones, but it's actually about supporting, um, about supporting internationalization within Node Core itself, which is, it was kind of sad because like within the last 90 days it got one comment, which is on an issue for making plans for the next uh, meeting to which nobody replied. <laughs> um, yeah. These things aren't there too. Okay, so what do we actually talk about within Node.js Node? Um, many, many bugs got fixed, and like there isn't that much left, at least not within the features that have basically existed forever, which is good. There are still like really, really odd edge cases. Um, uh, a lot of small optimizations, especially like, uh, I don't know if you know the name, Brian White is somebody who basically um, opens pull requests for optimizing some specific feature of Node every week or so. And we have a lot of CI trouble. It's not just the build infrastructure. We, we just run into problems with flaky tests, these things. Um, support for multiple platforms is always a thing. We're working hard to improve our tests. Um, this is something that we're going to do a lot at Tomorrow's Code and Learn, um, taking a look at her test suit. And um, yeah, just we, we have specific tasks for improving them. Um, we get many small help requests, many of which get redirected to the help repository. Um, release proposals, um, LTS backports, both of these take a lot of our issue and comment space. And longer term efforts, I think um, James mentioned async hooks and the errors transition. Uh, something interesting because like, it, it shows um, of how much of an edge case uh, we're dealing with. Um, the global objects in VM context, which many of you probably have never used, um, the VM module basically allows you to create new global objects and code that uses those and these things. Um, that has some pretty weird edge cases that don't quite work like they are supposed to. And yeah. I, I also looked at the comment counts for all issues, all time. And I'm, I'm really glad to just like see issues and PRs that were labeled tests or doc, those got the most comments by t in total by far. Um, which is, it really shows how stable Node has actually become. Um, some other things that generate a lot of discussions are Semver Major and Semver Minor PRs. Um, I think that's kind of obvious um, because like there's always discussion should we break this thing, should we not? Um, or should we add, add this feature, should we not? Um, people are always going to have opinions and we're always going to talk about that. 
And finally, um, I have taken a look at who actually has a voice within, the, um, within those uh, emails from the last 90 days. And it turns out uh, James Snell, um, <laughs> he actually makes about 10% um, of those 37,000 emails. <laughs> um, next one is Rich Trott, who just like um, deserves applause on his own because like his job is making the test suit work always. And he's, he's one of the people on the Code and Learn team. And he's just like doing a fantastic job at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, after that, pretty new collaborators, actually, Raphael Ackerman and Ruben Bridgewater, uh, the latter of which is here. Um, those are pretty active people, and it's always great to see new collaborators become really engaged and uh, excited about working on Node. Uh, after that, me, actually. Uh, ben Ortaus, Miles Barnes, and probably quite a few people that you have heard of before. Um, by the way, the, uh, I, I took a look at the numbers like, and how that goes on. And just so you get a feeling, about 5% of all comments were authored by women, which is not a great statistic. And I'd really like to see that improve. And finally, what can we actually do better? So one thing that's really frustrating me is those 30,000 notifications that we get over a couple months. That is far too much to process for many people. And we need to get better at making information available on a selective basis for the community, for people who want to engage with Node Core. One thing that we are doing is using GitHub Teams for just for notifications. For example, for async hooks, whenever something is coming up on that front, um, we have a team that's at Node.js slash async hooks that gets notified for that stuff for people who don't actually want to be involved in everything that's happening. And something else that we should really be doing is talk more about what we're doing, talk more about, like, I should, when I'm working on Node internals, probably talk a lot more about what I'm doing, writing texts about that, these kinds of things. And that's basically it.